Okay, the next section 24.3, uh, from fibers to textiles. So then once we just manufacture the fibers or yarn, so then these can be used to uh, produce uh, several other products that we need. For example, now we can manufacture the textiles or fabrics. So to manufacture the textiles from the fibers, there are several, several techniques which are well established actually, and also some of them are really old. The weaving, knitting, braiding, and stitching. So they are well established techniques to manufacture textiles from fibers. For example, weaving is a really old technique which can go up to even stone age. So it is well established. And then you might see these old type of manual, uh, the weaving machines in some places, sometime in museums, and also there are some demonstrations uh, going on, maybe in some countries, they are, they are still using uh, this machine in the in villages to manufacture some textiles. Okay, let's look at briefly how these processes work and then what are the main mechanisms behind these processes. Okay, in the weaving process, so it involves the interlacing of two sets of yarn or fiber. So the one set is called work, the other one called is the weft, right? So then this has several steps called shedding, picking, and beat up. So this will repeat and then uh, during that time, so we will get the fabric. So as I mentioned before, so this is really old type of technique that was invented long ago. And then if you remember the something called hand loom machines, okay, this is a type of example for uh, the weaving, but so now these are not manual. So we can find uh, the weaving machines which are really automatic with nice technologies. Okay, so if you look at some illustration here, which is uh, figure 103, uh, in your lecture notes. So now this, this will illustrate how this process works. So this is the product that we need and then this is how it has been made. So we can recognize these are the verbs. Okay, this is what we call weft, right? So then verb and weft here, right? Cut carefully now. So the verb is in this direction now. So we lift them one after the other. Okay, in between them, we just try to put the weft fiber. So then after that, we just try to pick in means, so then we try to get the weft in between uh, these uh, the work fibers. Okay, so after that, the beat up, so that means we have to just uh, the properly packed this weft uh, the fiber um, into the fabric. If you have seen manual weaving machines, you will find some uh, kind of uh, the wooden piece uh, that, that is used to beat up the, the uh, fibers. So that means weft it should be placed properly uh, the, within the structure. So then it will be, it will look like this to maintain the like same distance and then the, the fiber should look like the homogeneous like this. Okay, and then again the shedding process. So then we try to uh, the pick one after the other, uh, the worked fibers and then uh, the pick the, the worked fiber and, th and then after that beat up process again. So as I said, this is a continuous process and then at the end, so you will get the, the complete fabric and then which is having a, very simple arrangement, okay? So, but it is a really old and then nicely established technique. Uh, so this illustrate uh, the, how it works. And also if you, this, is, this will illustrate the mechanism behind, this is weft, 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 and then you will have the weft. Weft fibers are threaded between the weft, okay? You can add these, uh, the letters in red and the arrows uh, accordingly in, into your figure 103 uh, to make the figure complete. Here are some of the examples uh, of textiles which are manufactured using uh, the, the weaving techniques, right? So okay, you can you can have very basic designs. So even we can have some sort of uh, the the uh, the designs here patterns if you need. So you can see the arrangement of the weft and work fibers here. Okay, All right. There's some other possible arrangements. Yes, there are so many things that we can do with the weaving technique. But if you do it manually, it is it is going to be really uh, the slow process actually. So, so this video will provide a nice demonstration about uh, how the industrial loom process is working. So you will find a good demonstration of uh, the weaving process in relating to manufacturing of textiles. Weaving has been around since the early stone age. The basic concept hasn't changed, but the speed and sophistication have. Millions of miles of fabric are needed every year to meet consumer demand. It would be impossible to do without the industrial loom. High speed machines all over the world, like these outside of Leeds, England, help meet the high demand. Let's see how they work.
basic materials needed for weaving are two sets of threads. The first set is called the warp, two rows stretched lengthwise. The second set is called the weft, and it goes back and forth between the warp. Every time the weft goes through, the warp moves to trap it. The threads are now becoming a piece of fabric. To keep them from unraveling, a reed pushes the threads together. Then, the whole process starts again. To mass-produce a wide range of fabrics, thousands of different threads have to be organized. Devices called heddles provide control for the machine. Each one has an eye through which individual warps are threaded. This gives the machine control of thread movement. Heddles are suspended on the loom shafts located here. When a shaft is raised, the heddles go up and the threads move with them. A few hundred heddles and two shafts moving up and down together are required to create simple patterns. Industrial looms have thousands of heddles and up to two dozen shafts, all moving independently. How does this machine get its speed? To manufacture massive amounts of fabric in a cost-effective manner, the loom needs to move the weft through the warp as fast as possible. Old-style looms use a shuttle, which is a spool of thread that unravels as it's moved manually back and forth. Shuttles are reliable, but slow and in constant need of reloading. This presents two challenges for the modern loom. First, how to weave thread quickly without a shuttle and spool. Second, how to minimize thread reloading. Rapiers are one of the most efficient replacements for shuttles. One rapier picks up a piece of thread pulls it to the middle of the warp and passes it off to a second rapier. The second rapier pulls the thread the rest of the way across, while the first one goes back for another strand. Because spools no longer have to travel back and forth, the rapiers can draw thread from larger bobbins. This process results in less downtime for reloading, which dramatically improves the machine's productivity. On an industrial loom, this handoff happens over a thousand times per minute. But how does the loom create different patterns and textures? A geometric pattern like plaid begins by loading the warp with rows of different colored thread. Sending dark and light colored threads through the rows, the loom can create almost any pattern. The trick is switching between colors. For that, the loom needs a weft presenter, which is a component that selects colors from different bobbins and gives them to the rapiers while they work. For complex patterns, a loom with a jacquard attachment is required. This device controls all of the threads loaded into the machine. Instead of combining the threads together onto the shafts of a standard loom, every strand has its own control system. So with the jacquard attachment, operators can control the paths of each thread into ornate designs. Instructions are sent to each individual thread as it races through thousands of weaves to create a pattern. Its namesake, Joseph Marie Jacquard, invented the first of these mechanical marbles in 1801. Until then, this kind of work had to be done by hand and was extremely expensive. Jacquard's machine used punch cards to control individual threads. Its modern descendant now works electronically. Designs and patterns are programmed into the machine. The threading of the Jacquard loom is so labor intensive, it's usually done just once. When it's time to change colors, 
new threads are tied onto the existing ones. Even for a small loom with only a few thousand ends, the process can take days. Without these weaving powerhouses, the cost of a single suit would be outrageous. But thanks to the industrial loom, we have the clothes on our backs. I think it was a really nice demonstration. You can understand how fast the process is now. So actually the weaving process is a really simple process. You have two threads of uh, the fibers uh, or the strings, the woof and weft, and then you just try to uh, the, uh, go through three steps, but uh, the, it is really slow if you do it manually. However, with this highly technological industrial loom machines, so we can manufacture fabrics uh, using weaving uh, really uh, quickly uh, with a reasonable cost. So if you would like to watch the video separately, you can use this link on the top uh, to watch the video directly in, in YouTube. Right, next let's look at the knitting process. Okay, so in the knitting process, it involves the formation of interconnected loops of uh, fiber or yarn, okay? So it has uh, the bit more complicated uh, the technique compared to the weaving process. Uh, we have to create uh, interconnected loops uh, to, uh, to manufacture textile using the knitting process. Okay, so the knitted fabrics consist of consecutive loops called stitches. So that is important. So we have to create stitches uh, by using some particular technique. Okay, so uh, the here you could see now the stitches here, right? So this is the pattern for knitting. And then, so here you see the stitches over there now. So for example, if you want to have the, the line number six here or the, the row number six, so then uh, the, the needle should pass through these stitches here, right? So uh, one row of stitches, we call it the course, and then one column of stitches, we call it the veil, right? Okay, so the, there are two types of uh, the knitting techniques, the weft and woof knitting, right? As I said, again, I'm not going to look into more details here. Techniques of these two knitting techniques, the weft knitting is the most commonly used by manufacturers, mostly to uh, the, the, uh, the manufacture shirts and uh, the, the socks. Right. In the next slide, I'm going to demonstrate uh, the needle action of uh, the knitting process uh, just for a weft knitting process, not for the work. Okay, so just a demonstration of the needle action of the weft knitting process. So here you will find uh, the basic arrangement of a needle used in knitting process. Okay, right. So we can understand the, the main uh, the parts here. So uh, we call the hook. So this is the place where we just try to uh, the, the hook the, uh, the string or the fiber. And this is a latch. Okay, so spring loaded one, you know this one. So when we just lift it to somewhere here, it will come back. But if you lift to somewhere here, it will just automatically the close this and then uh, the, the, it will create a loop here, which is a closed loop, right? So this is the butt. Okay, so this is important. And this will help to control uh, the, the action of the needle in the vertical direction, okay? So this will run through a cam. Let's look at that in a minute. What will happen when the needle is in action? You can see that now the needle is just uh, the passing, uh, the needle has just passed through uh, uh, the one of the stitch, right? Okay, it is ready to pick the next yarn or, or to create the next stitch. So this is the resting position now. So then uh, the needle is just uh, through this stitch here, right? So then after that, it's the clearing process. That means the, the now the latch has just cleared this stitch here. Step three is now the yarn receiving. So then uh, the, it will pick the next yarn. So then when it comes down automatically, this, this, this stitch uh, will, will cause to close this uh, the latch here. Okay, in this step number four, that now we can see that it has already been closed. Step three is known as yarn receiving, while the step four is known as uh, the cast off or knock over. Right, okay, so then now it is moving down and then it is about to create a new uh, the stitch. So now it has moved down the stitch formation Right, the new stitch has formed already. So, so then uh, this needle has to just uh, the release this, uh, the, the, uh, the fiber from, uh, from its hook. So as, as needle move up, so it's automatically open up, this latch automatically open up and then it will clear the fiber and then it will take the next one to create the next stitch. Right, right. this explain uh, the, the path of the needle during these uh, the, uh, uh, stages, okay? So this is what we call a cam the cam to guide the needle. Cam is a kind of groove, okay? Uh, drill through this, uh, the, some of the, uh, the material, let's say it could be a metal or wood, whatever. 
So this part of the needle will just travel through this groove or the cam to provide the required motion to the needle during these stages. Right, okay. So the cam is a mechanical device. So depending on the geometry, for something to be just traveled through, then we have to decide the required design of the cam. Okay, so in the stage one now, the cam is just really having a, a very straight, uh, the, uh, the, or the horizontal path, and then there is no vertical movement for the, the, uh, the needle. It will travel through this way, and then during the clearing process, it will move up here. Okay, during the clearing process, it will move up. Okay, and then as it comes to the, the section three, or the part three, or the step three, and four, it is just moving down. And then when the, the loop pull in, so at, at the stage five, it is, it is at the lowest possible position vertically, right? So then after that now, again, it will move back to the, the running uh, process uh, the, the, uh, to, uh, to, to start a new stitch. So this cam will drive the needle to clear, receive, and then knock over and stitch formation. And then it, it repeats uh, the uh, create a new, new stitch again. So this is how the needle in the, in the knitting process working. But actually, to be clear with you, so then I'm not expecting you to just uh, uh, remember this uh, the needle action here, okay? Just to illustrate how it works. But so in normal actual processes, so there could be thousands of needles like this, depending on the requirement or how many stitches you're going to form at the same time, okay? Nice video here to demonstrate how the knitting process works. Knitting is defined as the intermeshing of yarn into loops to form fabric. There are different ways that yarn can be subjected to the needles for fabric formation. In knitting, there are basically two systems. These are weft and warp. What makes them different? Let's take a close look at each one. Weft knitting is accomplished by loops formed in a horizontal manner by adjacent needles. The most common machine used for weft knitting is the circular knitting machine. This machine creates a tube of fabric in a spiral configuration around a cylinder. The width of the fabric is determined by the number of needles on the machine. One revolution of the machine completes one course for each yarn fed. A second type of machine can be used to produce weft knit. This machine produces fabric on needle beds that are flat, so it's called a flatbed machine. Regardless of the type of machine used, in weft knitting, needles placed next to each other knit one after another in sequence to produce one row of loops from the same yarn. Here is an illustration of how loops of yarn are created by a weft knitting machine that knits yarn in a horizontal manner so that the loops are formed from right to left. If you analyze the structure, you see a pattern of loops arranged in rows and columns. The horizontal row of loops produced by adjacent needles during the same knitting cycle is known as a course. The course count is measured by the number of courses per linear unit, expressed as inches or centimeters. If this drawing represents a one inch by one inch area, you identify this as five courses per inch. The vertical column of loops produced by the same needle knitting at successive knitting cycles is referred to as a whale. The whale count is measured by the number of whales per linear length. In this same drawing, there are five whales per inch. The second system used for knitting is produced by machines that are designed differently to vertically knit. This illustration shows you how warp knitting, in contrast to weft knitting, is accomplished by forming loops in a vertical direction. If you look closely at an illustration of warp knit, you see that the yarn is intermeshed vertically with two whales. With warp knitting machines, each individual loop is created from separate lengthwise yarns. Wound onto a beam from yarn packages in a creel, the yarns arranged as a warp must be placed parallel to each other. Normally, for the most basic of fabrics, each yarn needs its own needle. If 1,000 needles are used on this machine, there needs to be a minimum of 1,000 warp yarns. If there is more than one yarn provided for each needle, more elaborate fabrics can be produced. With warp knitting, individual needles knit simultaneously across the width of the machine. Loops are formed by needles knitting a series of warp yarns fed vertically and parallel to the direction of the fabric formation. 
Warp knitting machines are typically used to produce tricot, rochelle, and crochet. Then let's look at the braiding process. This is another method uh, th that we can use to manufacture textiles from uh, the fibers or yarns. Okay. In this process, what will happen is that a number of filaments, we call them toes, are held together at one point and then interlaced with each other, right? So, so there is one point, the one end of the fi fibers are just held at that point and then each individual fiber would just uh, the follow some pattern to create the required geometry. Okay, the most common type of braiding is the circular braiding process, which is the simplest. And also it just resembles the Mayfold dance. Okay, if you have not seen that, I'll show you some kind of image. So how it happens, right? So in this process, what is showing that it is trying to create a tubular, uh, the, or the hollow structure uh, using the fibers. You will notice here that for the braided component, there should be an axis of symmetry. Okay, such as tubes here now. So even here you will see kind of axis of symmetry. So then it, this, this should be symmetrical around this axis here. In this one is a tubular shape again, something similar to this. So then this is symmetrical around uh, the, the central axis here. So you can add this to your note actually. The mechanical performance of a textile depends critically not only on the fibers used in their construction, but also on the details of their manufacture. So this is what uh, we call the Maypole dance here. So you'll see now, so this point, uh, these uh, the ropes or strings are held together okay at one point and then after that so these uh, the the kids will just move along with some specific pattern so then it will create this kind of structure afterwards the the component manufactured through braiding can be used in uh, multiple applications uh, like technical textile applications medical structures or the cables anchoring ships sometimes you might have seen in automobile and the aerospace industry some of the tubes or the, the some of the structures are covered with uh, the, the braided uh, the fabrics uh, or to make them more strong or to protect them against the environmental or some other damages and so on. Okay, normally in the past, the braiding was used mainly to, to uh, manufacture some decorative fabrics, right? The braiding can be classified into two types, 2D or 3D braiding. So 2D braiding structures can be circular or flat braid. And the 3D braiding is relatively new and was developed mainly for manufacturing composite structures. So here, th these are some information for you to read through. These are not available in the lecture notes, some of the extra information you can read through. Here you will see some kind of nice, nice examples where the people using the braiding process to manufacture some uh, the, the uh, braided components. Here you see they, they create in this uh, the tubular shape, uh, the carbon fiber based uh, the structure. And this is a glass fiber structure. And then all of the time, they just try to uh, manufacture some hollow shape structures uh, by interlacing uh, the fibers uh, in a complicated manner. So most of the time, so this could be uh, to wrap up some tubes or maybe some structures in some particular applications to provide. In, in nowadays, the braiding has become one of the important techniques used in uh, the composite industry, especially in aerospace and automotive applications. Here is a good demonstration to illustrate how the braiding process work uh, with uh, the carbon fibers. There are a number of braiding machines available in the James Lighthill building uh, using carbon fibers and glass fibers. So actually sometimes the textile technology students will have a chance to use some of these machines during their dissertation experiments.